Good morning. Uh, I'd like to call the Assembly Appropriations Committee uh, May 6, 2015 hearing to order. Um, Madam Secretary, call the roll. Gomez? Here. Bigelow? Present. Bloom? Here. Bonta? Calderon? Chang? Daly? Eggman? Gallagher? Here. Garcia? Holden? Jones? Here. Quirk? Here. Rendon? Wagner? Weber? Here. Wood? Here. We have a quorum. Now we'll, we'll begin with uh, Mr. O'Donnell. Mr. Chair, I have two bills. Shall we start with AB 552? Please do. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chair and committee members. Today I'm pleased to present AB 552, which seeks to keep the cost of public work, works projects low by requiring public agencies to specify all potential damages associated with project delays up front and in their public works Move projects. the bill. Traditionally, public works contracts have included penalties for contracts that fail to deliver projects on time. Common penalties included, include liquidated damages, which have a set dollar amount that both the agency and the contractor agreed to prior to signing the contract. Recently, several local public agencies have begun using penalty provisions such as consequential damages and not disclosing the amount of damages a contractor may be subject to. The uncertainty created by these undefined damages has led to situations where some projects simply cannot be underwritten by an insurance company. AB 552 restores certainty to public contracts by requiring agencies to disclose consequential damages amounts for project delays up front before a contract is signed. Thank you. Uh, witnesses in support? Um, Mr. Chair, Member Scott Governor here on behalf of the Construction Employers Association. Assembly Member O'Donnell said it well. These open ended damage clauses create problems for contractors, especially small businesses. They are uninsurable risk. Um, it is a deviation from standard practice. So um, we think this bill would resolve that problem by providing certainty. Thank you. Thank you. Any other witnesses in support? Individuals from the public in support? Witnesses in op opposition, individuals from the public in opposition, um, Department of Finance. Good morning, Erica Lee with the Department of Finance. No file on this. No file. We have a motion in the second. Um, any questions or comments from the committee members? Uh, seeing none, Mr. O'Donnell, your bill is out on an A roll call. Thank you. Thank you so much. Second bill. If you're ready, Mr. Chair. Thank the you. The floor is yours. Mr. Chair and members, AB 566 does two things. First, the bill requires contractors, any subcontractors for school district lease, leaseback, and leased owned projects to use a skilled and trained workforce. Move the bill. Second. This bill will provide some assurances that we are getting a quality product. There will be a savings in, to the extent the, the districts avoid having to redo a substandard job. The second part of this bill deals with pre-qualification. AB uh, 1565 by the former chair of this committee, Assemblymember Fuentes, requires for five years school districts using state bond funds to pre-qualify potential contractors and major subcontractors for any project over $1 million. The Department of Industrial Relations is required to submit a report to the legislature in 2018. Since the enactment of AB 1565, state bond funds for new construction and modernization projects have been exhausted. This bill will extend pre-qualification to all school construction projects over $1 million, regardless of the funding source. Costs are minimal, as most school districts have already established a pre-qualification process. Thank you. Witnesses in support? Mr. Chair, Member Cesar Diaz, on behalf of the State Building and Construction Trades Council, uh, pre-qualification ensures that the district gets the best qualified contractors. It weeds out a lot of the problem contractors beforehand and at least lets the agencies know when there's problems with a particular business and how they operate in previous uh, public works project. 
We believe this bill will save school districts money, it will create a more efficient, streamlined workforce, as well as attracting better contractors on lease lease spec projects. For those reasons, we urge your support. Thank you. Thank you so much. Any other witnesses in support? Individuals from the public in support? Witnesses in opposition? Individuals from the public in opposition? Department of Finance? No file. Uh, questions or comments from the committee members? <clears throat> Ms. Weber? Yes. I, I no <clears throat> excuse me. I noticed in the opposition there was concern about apprenticeship programs. What are we, are we dealing with that or going to try to figure that out between now and then? The uh, opponents of, of 566 are basically creating a different problem that is uh, cited when there's deficient programs. Right now the state of California approves about 500 building and construction trades programs. A lot of them are the non-union, but the majority are the building and construction mm -hmm. trades. They have the best graduation rates. They invest in, in apprenticeship facilities mm -hmm. and apprenticeship training. Um, what they would like to do is open up to the the, the, the apprenticeship programs that actually mm -hmm. don't graduate apprentices mm -hmm. and right. fail to actually invest in training. And so we're never going to take those amendments. Mm -hmm. I think those are just detrimental to the entire apprenticeship system. But it will include the apprenticeship that's run by the... That okay, is true. I just want to make sure that... Okay, that's sounds that's, true. A, that's actually a focus of... One of the focuses of this bill. Yes. It actually okay. offers... It, it improves our workforce through training, i.e. Right. the okay. apprenticeship program. I just want to make sure they weren't all excluded. Good. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman and members, Dave Ackerman representing the Associated General Contractors. We've been involved in both pre-qualification design bill for, uh, for years in designing the statutes, and we are in support of the legislation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Any other questions or comments from the commitment? Mr. Gallagher? Yeah. Um, you know, in the bill right now, there's a, a provision that would waive the reporting requirements if there is a project labor agreement. Uh, on the on the project, why why waive that reporting requirement in those cases? Why not just have it across the board and in every case that you do this uh, reporting for contractors to demonstrate that they have a skilled workforce? Good. Mr. Yali, that's a great question. What the project labor agreement ensures is they workforce on a specific construction project or a construction program. Most of the apprentices and the workers that get sent on PLA projects get dispatched out of union hiring halls. Basically, they're union members that have been skilled and trained through the state apprenticeship program. So because they've already gone through a state approved program plus the benefits of working with contractors, they get a highly skilled level of training that is already guaranteed under a project labor agreement. Project labor agreement also allows for targeted hiring disadvantaged communities, veterans, women, uh, emancipated youth from the foster care system to ensure that they, those individuals also have the opportunity for a rewarding career in construction. So going above and beyond sets a stronger policy, doesn't, shouldn't be redundant in, in uh, reporting those requirements when you have a PLA. Because, so in other and that's words, because you're already reporting them. So in other words, PLA. in that PLA, it will have that in there already? That's okay. Thank you so much. Uh, any other questions or comments from the committee members? If not, this bill is out on a B roll call. Thank you so much, Mr. O'Donnell. <coughs> Mr. Dodd, you're up. Mr. Dodd, you have one bill on suspense and one with the due pass recommendation. What's your pleasure? I'll start with the, the one that due pass, AB 279. That's okay with the chair? Yeah, please begin. Chair and members, AB 279 is a modest and logical extension of information sharing program, which has been immense use to cities throughout the state of California, in which the legislature is reauthorized in three different occasions. Move the bill. This bill simply extends the same voluntary programs to counties that cities have right now. I ask for your I vote. Thank you so much. We have a motion and a second. Witnesses in support. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Karen Lang on behalf of the California Association of County Treasurers and Tax Collectors. We don't anticipate every county will want to use it, but there are some counties that have vast amounts of unincorporated area that do have a lot of businesses in them. And those counties, such as Sacramento County, think they could take um, great advantage of this if this were to ex be extended to include them. We ask for your I vote. Thank you. Thank you so much. Any other witnesses in support? Individuals from the public in support? Witnesses in opposition? Individuals from the public in opposition? Department of Finance? 
No file. No file. Questioners or comments from the committee members? Jones? Mr. Dodd, on, on, can you explain or walk me through? The FTB is going to be sharing private information, per, personal information with the cities and counties. Is, that, is there a restriction on that private information on mm -hmm. what they can share with the cities and counties? And I guess where I'm concerned is, is it limited to only that information necessary for the cities and counties to do this work, or is it going to be a package of data that's downloaded from FTB to the cities and counties that's going to include other, uh, the, the person's other personal information that's not necessary to, this, to the process and other people's personal information that's not even connected to this at all? Go ahead, Karen. Um, if I could answer through the chair, Mr. Jones. Um, it's a very specific set of data. Before you can even enroll in the program as a county, you have to go through a verification process that you have the right um, information protection um, system in place. And then there are four data points that the city would provide to FTB or the county if we were to be included. And there are five data points that the FTB would provide to the local government. I could read them to you if you want me to, but it's a very, very specific set of information. If you, and, Yeah, maybe briefly. Sure. Uh, um, for the, the cities would provide to the FTB, the business owner, um, and the address, the social security number, and the North American Industry Classification Code or Standard Industry Classification Code. code. And then the FTB would provide the city the taxpayer name, address, SSN or FEIN, entity type, and the principal business activity. And these are, but, but only for people that are being reviewed by the cities and counties, not, not a mass download of no, no, other no. people that aren't connected to this no. in any way. Okay. No. And one, one additional point, so there's over 100 cities that have been using this for many, many years, and there's not been one uh, data breach uh, for many of the cities so far. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you so much. Any other questions or comments from the committee members? If not, Mr. Dodd, would you like to close? Yes. Um, the FTB estimates that the passage of this bill would result in over $1.3 million in revenue over the next three years, which, by the way, will go a long way in helping pay for my next bill that I'll be presenting to you. <laughs> so with that, I ask for your eye vote. Thank you, Mr. Dodd. This bill, uh, we have a motion and a second. This bill is out on a nay roll call. Uh, your you next bill, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. You know, you're not required to present on suspense bills. Yeah, I, I know, and I, with respect, all due respect to the, the, the time of the members here, I know this bill will be a suspense candidate, but I wanted to take the opportunity. I think this is an important issue, and so if the, the committee would indulge me, I'll quickly go through the, the high points on this. This bill, uh, AB 1354, seeks to promote pay equity by requiring state contractors to have policies to help prevent uh, unlawful discrimination with regard to gender and racial uh, pay discrimination. It will compile data on wages paid to state contractor employees by gender and race. Over the last decade, full-time uh, working women have continued to earn on an average just 77 cents on the dollar of their male counterparts. In 2013, that disparity amounted to an, uh, an average of $11,000 and equates to hundreds of thousands of dollars over a lifetime. For women of color, this disparity is even worse. Income inequality shortchanges families and adds to retirement insecurity. I'm working with the committee, stakeholders, and the department to, for, uh, on the proposed author amendments to help minimize costs of this program and will continue to do so. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much. Uh, any witnesses of support? Uh, witnesses from the public and support? Addie Myers on behalf of the American Association of University Women California in support. Mr. Chair and members, Caitlin Vega for the California Labor Federation, also here in support. Great. Any others? Seeing that, uh, witnesses in opposition, individuals from the public in opposition, Department of Finance. No file, Mr. Chair. No file. Uh, committees, uh, committee members, questions or comments? Assemblymember Dodd, I appreciate your leadership in bringing this bill forward, and I'm proud to be co author on the bill. Thank you, Ms. Bonta. Thank you so much. Anything else? Just when it gets to that point, I, I would respectfully ask for your I vote. Thank Great. you. Great. Your bill's on suspense. Thank you, Mr. Dodd. Thank you. Ms. Garcia, you're up. Ms. Garcia, you have one bill with a due pass recommendation. 
Good morning. AB 53 would require children to remain in rear facing car seats until the age of two. This would bring California law in line with the 2011 recommendation by the American Academy of Pediatrics. Despite educational campaigns by doctors and the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, not enough parents are changing their behavior. 75% of parents still turn their children forward facing too early. The average cost of a child being hospitalized due to a motor vehicle accident is around $250,000. When people put a price tag on the cost of a child dying in these accidents, it's over a million dollars. However, we all know you can't put a price on the life of a child. The cost of the bill is estimated to be minor and absorbable. We have been asked if this bill would put a burden on parents by forcing them to buy new car seats. We have also been asked if all car seats sold will meet the requirement in our bill. Current law says that children under the age of eight must be properly buckled into car seats or boosters. This means that parents already buy new car seats and boosters as their child grows out of their current seat. It also means that parents already have to think about whether the car seat they are buying will fit their child. Not all of them will. My district has underserved communities and I am aware of the challenges facing California's low income families. Every child should have access to safety no matter how much money their parents make. The CHP and others recognize this and already have programs to give away free car seats and boosters across the state. I respectfully ask for an I vote. Thank you so much. Witnesses in support, individuals from the public in support, witnesses in opposition, individuals from the public in opposition, Department of Finance. The uh, Department of Finance is neutral on this bill. We note that there would be minor and absorbable costs for both CHP and DMV. Thank you so much. Questions or comments from the committee members? See none. Uh, no, wait, wait, no, Mr. Well, Bailo. Um, Ms. Garcia, first of all, I'd like to applaud for what you're doing today. As the probably the only member sitting here that's an EMT, been a fireman for 40 years, and seen far too many accidents that I would love to forget and wipe from my memory banks of, of, of many horrific accidents. In particular, the worst are those where children are affected, whether they're just simply injured or most critically injured. Those are horrible situations. And in all of those cases, it's become very evident it's the lack of restraint and the proper care of our, our young children, um, in many cases by their own parents. Hopefully, this will help uh, stop and stem some of that tragic um, brutality that occurs to youth. So anyway, I applaud you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Mr. Bonta? I'm just going to move the bill. Thank you. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. Mr. Gallagher? Um, just one question. You know, we have the rule on, you know, eight and under have to be in a car seat or a booster. <clears throat> is there something, is there data showing that even with that, the current law that somehow um, we're, it's not working for kids under yes. two? Yes. So uh, the recommendation by uh, pediatrics uh, and most uh, professionals is for them to be rear facing because up until the age of two, their bodies are such that when there's an accident, if not rear facing, 75% of them uh, have pretty big injuries to their backs, to their necks, to their spinal cords, and oftentimes can also lead to death. And so there is a lot of studies and research. And so there's been a campaign for years now encouraging parents to be rear facing until the age of two, uh, but about 75% of the parents are not adopting that practice. Okay, any other questions or comments? Ms. Garcia, would you like to close? Respectfully ask for your I vote. Thank you so much. We have a motion and a second. Uh, this bill is out on a B roll call with Bigelow and Chang I. Thank you so much. Now, Mr. Manshine, you're up. You have uh, three. Four bills on consent and AB 193 on suspense. What's your pleasure? Uh, okay, with the chair, can I present briefly on AB 193? Uh, you can. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair and members. Today I present AB 193. This bill would serve to get individuals with severe mental illnesses that are overlooked by current law the help and treatment they need through an LPS conservatorship. Under current law, only a professional from a county agency or designated facility providing intensive treatment or evaluation services may make a recommendation for conservatorship. If an individual is not receiving such intensive treatment or evaluation services from the county, no such recommendation can be made and no 
and no LPS conservatorship may be contemplated. This bill would permit a court faced with relevant medical and other evidence to recommend evaluation of an existing probate conservatee to determine whether an LPS conservatorship is appropriate. This bill covers a, a very narrow group of people uh, and they must still meet the criteria for an LPS conservatorship before one is granted. Uh, most of the uh, people impacted by this bill will likely go through an investigation process at some point. Uh, I think there is even some potential uh, for, for uh, actual savings if this bill goes into effect. With the current 5150 process, conservatorships aren't generally considered until most families have been forced to cut ties altogether with their loved ones, uh, forcing an eventual conservatorship to be conserved by the county. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the time and the opportunity to present AB uh, 193, which will provide an opportunity for more concerned family members to get help for their loved ones uh, while they're still in the picture and willing to manage the conservatorship resulting in a smaller workload for public guardians. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair and members. Thank you so much. Witnesses and support? Larry Doyle on behalf of the Conference of California Bar Associations, the sponsor of AB 193. Existing law provides no way to address a problem of a probate conservatee who has reached a point due to mental illness or chronic alcohol abuse that conservators can no longer control their actions, and these conservatees therefore pose a physical threat to themselves or the people around them. Under existing law, these conservatees cannot be sent to a hospital, otherwise confined against their will, nor can they be required to take uh, prescribed medication. The best that can happen under current law is that they will be picked up by law enforcement while running free and be placed in the traditional 5150 hold process. The alternative is that they will hurt themselves or someone else before that can happen. AB 193 offers a way to protect these individuals and to provide them with the help that they need. Opponents of the bill have uh, stated that uh, the problem is that the probate court judges will use this authority liberally leading to many more unnecessary and inappropriate investigations. That won't happen. First, the judges that make the referrals authorized by AB 193 are almost invariably the same judges who review the evidence in and grant LPS conservatorships under exist, uh, existing process. In 57 of California's 58 counties, the probate and mental health courts are combined. And in the vast majority, like Sacramento and all smaller sized counties, the same judge who handles the probate calendar also handles the LPS calendar. So they are well aware of the requirements for establishing an LPS conservatorship and will not waste the investigator's time unless it is absolutely necessary. Second, the judges in L Los Angeles County, the one exception to the combined court rule, and other counties in which different judges may handle seconds. the probate and calendars, are aware of the evidentiary standard beyond a reasonable doubt for establishing an LPS conservatorship and therefore will not waste the time of the court or investigators doing these unnecessarily. We believe this is a good bill and we ask the committee's uh, favorable consideration when the time comes. Thank you so much. Any other witnesses in support? Individuals from the public in support? Witnesses in opposition? Individuals from the public in opposition? Department of Finance? No file. No file. Questions or comments from the committee members? If not, Mr. Mengshan, would you like to close? Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair and members, and we uh, would respectfully request your support. Thank you so much, Mr. Mengshan. <laughs> Mr. Medina, you're up. AB 573 with the due pass recommendation. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. AB 573 will provide relief and opportunity to the 13,000 California students harmed by the closure of Corinthian colleges. Move the bill. Second. Current state and federal law provide some relief to some of the students affected by the closure through loan forgiveness and tuition recovery. This bill ensures that all California students are fully protected. I uh, respectfully ask for your I vote. Thank you so much. Witnesses in support. <coughs> Mr. 
Mr. Chairman, Matt Back on behalf of CAPS, California Association of Private Post-Secondary Schools. I, I do not have a support or oppose uh, position. Um, our association is still reviewing the bill and, and uh, waiting to see the analysis and other things, but we do have some concerns. Um, just, just so we're clear, my association does not represent Corinthian, um, nor am I here to defend them. Um, our folks sympathize with the students, and in fact, many of our schools are working with them and trying to get them transferred to other institutions so they can continue their education. Um, we certainly don't, um, don't have issues with the community college component of the bill, allowing free tuition for these uh, impacted students, nor do we have a concern with the Cal Grant um, eligibility requirements. These are general fund commitments and certainly the purview of the legislature to give these uh, resources to those students. We do, however, have concerns with the components that um, deal with the Student Tuition Recovery Fund and the Legal Aid. Um, both of those components are funded by our students who are regulated by the Bureau or our institutions that are regulated by the Bureau. And HEALD was an exempt uh, institution. And so these resources are going to be diverted. These are special fund resources that are being diverted to students that did not pay into it. Um, I think that's on shaky legal ground whether or not we can divert those funds. Um, but also there's a precedent setting here that we do have concerns about. And, and it's going to be our students and our institutions that are going to be on the hook to repay those funds. And the bill does ask to double the STRIF up to $50 million. And again, our students are going to be the ones on the hook for it. Um, there are measures in place today to help these impacted students. If they do have a federal loan, the federal government is supposed to forgive that loan. Um, so I think we should try to utilize the federal dollars instead of using the California dollars to pay back these students. But you know, we're, we, we appreciate and, you know, what the author is doing and all the co-authors. We want to be supportive. Our institutions want to be supportive. But fundamentally, I just want to express those concerns with the two pieces dealing with STRIF and the legal aid. <laughs> Mr. Chair, if I could respond. Yes, you may. Um, it's my feeling as chair of higher education that California students should not be harmed, uh, referring to the HELD students, uh, for the inaction of the state, uh, and also that the uh, policy will be reviewed in the Higher Education Committee when it comes to committee next week. Thank you so much. Any other witnesses in support? Witnesses in opposition, individuals from the public in opposition, Department of Finance. No file, Mr. Chair. Question or comments from the committee members? Mr. Medina, would you like to close? I respectfully ask for your I vote. Thank you so much, Mr. Medina. You're absolutely correct. It um, doesn't matter where the students started off. These are all our students in the state of California. We do have a responsibility. Um, this bill is out on an A roll call. Thank you. Thank you. Dark, Dr. Wood, we're going to start with committee member. Well, we have Mr. Gatto. <laughs> Mr. Gatto, are you ready? Or should we go with the committee members first? Well, okay, we'll, we'll wait. Mr. Wood? Chair's permission, I'd like to start with AB 320. Please begin. Okay, Chair and members, thank you very much. Uh, AB 320 provides a path to licensure as environmental engineers for those professional engineers that do not fit under the scope of the existing practice and title acts. Currently, environmental engineers practice without an official license or regulations. As environmental protection programs continue to, to expand in scope and complexity, testing and certification of environmental engineers are needed to establish benchmarks Move for the competency. Bill. The Board for Professional Engineers, Land Surveyors, and Geologists will re be responsible for conducting an occupational analysis report. The one-time cost of this analysis is projected to be under $150,000. Testing, licensing, and establishing regulations for environmental engineers will ensure proper certification structure that will safeguard our communities. And Thank I had someone in support, but I don't see him. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Uh would uh, witnesses in support, witnesses, individuals from the public in support, witnesses in opposition? 
Good morning, Chairman Gomez and committee members. My name is Jeff Alameda from the California Board of Engineers, Land Surveyors, and Geologists. The board is in opposed position to AB 320 due to public protection concerns. Thank you so much. Any other individuals in opposition? Department of Finance? No file, Mr. Chair. No file. Questions or comments from the committee members? Say none. This is a uh, This bill has a due pass recommendation. It's, has, it's been moved and seconded. And this bill is out on an A roll call. Thank you, Mr. Chair.